Welcome to the Audio Socket Podcast. We're currently exploring the impacts of AI on the music industry and how artists and creators will thrive in an AI era. Hello, welcome back. I am excited to have everybody here today, and I'm excited to introduce Jesse Josephson, who is an artist, producer, and educator. Jesse's been an artist most of his life. After going through his garage band phase, he decided to get into production music in 2008. He's delivered over a thousand songs, had many, many thousands of syncs, everywhere from Keeping Up with the Kardashians, to The Voice, to American Idol, commercials for Ford, Outback Steakhouse, Nike, etc. And in 2016, he decided that he wanted to help other artists that were interested in building a career in production music. So welcome, Jesse. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, unlike the last time we went through a big tech revolution in the late 90s or the 2000s, we didn't really have uh, much of a seat at the table. So I'm really excited to join you here for this talk about AI. Awesome. So you recently started an AI series and I wanna talk about that. I wanna talk about what prompted you to start that, um, when you started it. But before we jump into that, I just want to get a little bit of terminology straight. So. I want to set up some basics, traditional versus generative AI. Um, in traditional AI, it performs specific tasks based on predefined rules and patterns, whereas generative AI stretches those limits and it strives to create entirely new data that resembles human created content. So just kind of setting up the stage for us to talk about traditional versus generative AI. And yeah, please tell us about why you got into talking about AI. Well, in a word, fear. Uh, I discovered these generative AI models um, in February or March of this year of 2023. And it was the Google Music LM model. They had a white paper and they didn't even actually release the model. They were just showcasing what the prompt was and what the output was. And even though the bit rate was very low, the quality of the music was pretty low, it almost sounded like at best, maybe Atari video game music. It was not high quality music. It was definitely not modern, certainly not licensable music ready for prime time placements. I saw a technology that was able to have a human being type in a prompt, like just describe music. And on the other end, some type of music come out of it. And I thought, hmm, how long is it gonna take before that output sounds pretty good and it sounds on par, maybe CD quality and on par with an average human composer. As I was seeing what was happening with ChatGBT and the uh, language, uh, large language models and how quickly they were developing and how quickly the hackers and the open source uh, community was jumping all over that and throwing all kinds of resources at it and expanding its capabilities like exponentially, it, I had no doubt that the same trajectory would happen with these music uh, models, with these generative AI models. Now, I feel like the music models are probably about two or three years behind the large language models, so we're not quite there yet. But it was essentially me realizing that we are in the midst of a massive technological revolution in all different fields of the world. Uh, so AI is not just disrupting us. We all want to think, well, why are they just disrupting us? They're not. It's not just disrupting us. It's disrupting every industry in small ways and in large ways. So as I saw this technology emerging, I thought, first of all, is this going to be a potential threat to us, right? If there's a algorithm and a generative model that can create, you know, maybe decent sounding background instrumental music, what would stop an ABC, NBC, CBS from using a model like that, as opposed to going to a production music catalog, which is where my primary bread and butter has been in my music career. That's really where most of my income was. Was well, you look at my royalty statements, it's background instrumental, background instrumental all over the place and many different reality shows and networks and cable shows and commercials and all that stuff. So I definitely first was reacting in fear. So I thought, what do we need to get our heads around with this technology? How do we need to understand it? Um, is there anything we can do to adapt, to adjust, to change our strategy? And there are, and we can talk about some of those things, but certainly it was fear in the beginning. And I think that's kind of the biggest feeling in the room right now with a lot of composers, especially in the sync licensing world is, well, either fear or dismissal, just scoffing at it and thinking, eh, it's not that impressive. I'm not worried about it. Or, oh my gosh, is this the end of human creativity as we know it? So certainly those were the two um, kind of emotions that I've been kind of wrestling with, with my audience for the last six, eight months, something like that. Which is a, an amazing um, question to ask. 
when you think about AI, is your general sentiment one of fear? Is it one of um, excitement or is the board out right now? It's a great question. I would say you have to ask me on a certain day, right? Because just like most emotions, we're pretty complex creatures. It's not always just one or the other. If I just read about a new company that's helping to create an AI search tool to allow music supervisors, editors to find human created music more easily and also create similar searches to that music, I'm excited about it because I'm like, this is technology that's going to enable more placements for us, get us in more relevant placement opportunities. And it's going to make the, the editors and music supervisors jobs a lot easier in terms of finding human created work. So I'm 100% on AI on that day. The day that I opened up Stability AI's website and saw that they're already at 44K sample rate, which is CD quality rate. And the music I was hearing on there was, you know, again, not 10 out of 10, not the best production music I've ever heard, but certainly good enough for somebody who maybe has a YouTube channel and just, you know, they went on a safari and they want to have some nice background music in the background. They don't want to pay a lot of money for it or pay anything for it. It's good enough for that already, right? Right now. So I see those kind of technological developments and I go, hmm, a little more on the fear side today because that's getting really good. And what does that mean for us? We don't really know about that. So I would say I have a very complex set of emotions. It kind of depends on the latest development and the latest trend that I've read about it. But I would say what I try to hang on to though, through that fear and through that uncertainty is I do hold on to a faith in opportunity of the future. So I do think that with every technological revolution, even though this seems like the biggest and the scariest one, it might also just because we're going through it right now. Um, the internet was also one of those for the music industry. It was big, it was scary, it was very disruptive. And of course, it hurt a lot of people. It put a lot of people out of business. It took a lot of profits and revenue down for a lot of major music companies out there because just the entire mi business model was changing. However, if you look into the future a couple of years, which is impossible to see while you're going through it, you do find in all technological revolutions opportunity and new horizons and new industries and new places to monetize your music and new ways to thrive with your music that we just can't even like think of or fathom right now. So I still hold on to that. It's faith. I'll, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I don't have any finger on the pulse of exactly where these opportunities are going to be. I have some ideas and we could talk about that. But I do look at the trends in history and I do think that there's always a case to be made for optimism with technological progress. Yeah. What AI tools are you currently using? So right now, I've actually tested quite a bit of the music AI tools that are available, and I have to say I have not stuck with any of them yet. Um, not to say that some of them won't get better, but I've definitely played a lot with the Isotope Ozone um, mastering plugin, which basically has an AI mastering assistant where you basically click one button on your track and it analyzes it. You can even upload reference tracks so it can kind of get it closer to whatever you want it to sound like. And I would say it's hit or miss. Sometimes it does okay. Sometimes it's really far out there and it's like, whoa, I, don't not, I do not like how that track is sounding. I, I do want to say though, with all of the AI tools that I have tried out, I think most of them so far are going to be great in terms of just kind of assisting us in some ways that have been kind of uh, maybe some of the tasks that we don't like doing. So one of the ones that I've used, I think it's, I don't know how, how you pronounce it, but it's Moasis, M-O-I-S. Yes, I think that's how it is. Um, essentially, it is a, um, a STEM creating tool. It's an AI program online. You can upload your full mix, and literally with a click of a button, it'll separate the drums. If you have guitar, bass, vocals, I think it does four, maybe even a couple of more. That is an amazing tool because making stems and alt mixes and all kinds of things, it's that's the part of this job that's very unglamorous and it sucks and it takes a long time and it's really boring. <laughs> it's the part of the job where I usually have just other music playing or a podcast playing because I'm just so click solo, click bounce. It's just so boring. So if I can use some of these tools to outsource some of the quote unquote boring work that we usually had to do, that's amazing. There's also some other tools out there. Um, I don't know if I can name them off the top of my head, but that help you with the metadata uh, as well. So you can literally upload your tracks to some of these sites and it'll analyze your track um, you, and it'll analyze the genre and the mood and the BPM and the tempo and the instruments. It'll do all that stuff automatically, spit it out into a nice organized Excel sheet. So that kind of stuff I get really excited about because a lot of this business you know, I, I want to spend as much time as I possibly can just creating music and as little time on the quote unquote work side of this. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, the points you make, we work with a couple of AI companies. Um, we'll actually be rolling something out called Mass Toolkit soon, which leverages AI stemming with Audio Shake. Um, it's got AIMS, which is what you talked about earlier. That's making finding and licensing music so much faster. If you're if you're looking for something really specific, you can upload a track or you or you can use AI um, prompting. But uh, 
it, it's kind of amazing to me because I, when I'm talking to new partners of ours about uh, what music licensing should look like, I talk about it as a product play. And what I mean by that is audio is such an overly engaging process. You have to click play on every single track. It's not like video or um, pictures where you can just scroll through. You really have to engage every single track. So I think there's massive transformations coming for us on the product front, and it will make our music so much more accessible. And, you know, to your point about stock, I mean, the definitely the human creative will have the opportunity to rise at that point. But um, yeah, it's it's exciting. I mean, definitely a lot of interesting opportunities right now. So as far as the artists go, have you heard of any licensing models that are looking at not only how artists make money today, but how they become part of a long-term revenue stream? Well, the obvious example always pops up is Grimes, which she came out a couple months ago and said, you know what, with these AI generative tools that create voices, um, a lot of the other artists, Drake, The Weeknd, the labels really that they were represented by were just slamming that down and saying, absolutely not. Take that off of Spotify. Take that offline. Uh, we don't approve of this. We don't want anything to do with this. So, so far, I have seen the labels kind of taking the same approach they took with Napster, which was just with a big hammer, smack it down, say no, resist it, stop it, sue it, that kind of a thing. Grimes came out and said, you know what? I'll open myself up to this and I'll split up the profits and the revenues 50-50 with any artist or anybody that comes in that I approve um, that wants to use my voice on their track. So I think that's a really interesting move. Um, I think it's also a really brilliant PR move by Grimes because um, even though she had some notoriety, I think her profile leveled up <laughs> quite a bit just as a result of this one move that she made. So it was a really smart move on, on her part. Um, now, how well that's going to work out, we got to see. There's obviously some concerns that a lot of artists have of like, well, what if somebody uses my voice for some lyrics that I don't agree with? Of course, there's going to be some concerns on how different artists navigate that. Uh, I think, though, that is the right approach, whether or not it's the 50-50 split or that model of how she's putting it together. I do think that you want to, if something's going to be disruptive and it's going to be in our world, whether you like it or not, I think resisting things and trying to stop it or sue it or get it out of your life um, is futile. It, you might make some progress and you might stop it for a while, get a law passed or something like that that'll, that'll sort of buy you a little bit of time. But in the long run, it's kind of like just this avalanche. This is slow moving and it's just going to keep moving things out of its way. So it's kind of better to just try to help go with that momentum and wrap your arms around this technology, which I think is what Grimes did, and figure out how can you create new revenue streams. Another thing I just saw was interesting was Meta. Uh, they just had their you know, kind of a keynote presentation connect a couple of weeks ago. And they now have these AI avatars that essentially are modeled after celebrities and athletes and that kind of thing. And they've they've paid these athletes and celebrities millions of dollars to use their likeness for these AI models that are trained off of their voice. I don't know how much it's trained off of their personality or how they got all that. But this is a new revenue source for a lot of athletes and celebrities that never had that before. Now, again, I'm not a celebrity and most people following me are not going to be eligible for that. But again, just looking at some of these companies and how they're realizing that using this technology to open up new revenue streams is a possibility. One that I've fantasized about, and maybe it could be a possibility, is there could be a situation where a production music library um, creates their own AI model, maybe not necessarily training um, or having their own AI model in-house, but basically kind of private labeling or white labeling somebody else's technology, but inputting their composer's content into their own AI model, and then being able to give that AI model to one of their TV or film clients and saying, listen, use our music, but if you can't find what you need, we've got this other alternative solution, which is an AI model based on all of our premium, high quality, private content. This isn't just a bunch of loops you can find online. This is really just from the high quality composers that we house. And you can generate tons of new content on the fly anytime you want to. So that could be something that could open up new revenue streams for the artists and composers that work with production music libraries. But again, this all remains to be seen. There's a lot of technical discussions about, legal discussions about that, and how do you structure a business model that feels fair to the people contributing to a model like that. That needs to be kind of ironed out. So something I've been thinking a lot about is uh, permissions and just sort of a call it a USPTO database, which would make it easy for people under to understand um, who's open to this, who's not open to this. I think some sort of a, a centralized hub that, you know, you can go in and search and, you know, you're looking for just traditional AI or generative AI and finding the people that are willing to do different things, I think would be very, very helpful because at the end of the day, all of this is going to have to scale somehow. Um, AI is moving very, very quickly and 
you know, in today's era, everything is sort of at scale. So I don't know if you've thought much about this. And if not, please don't, you know, don't don't stress too much over it. But are there certain aspects that you feel really are going to have to be addressed in a win-win solution for the artist in terms of what does that mean for you? Um, obviously, there's the permissions. That's just fundamental. But what are other aspects that you've thought about that you would want to make sure would be part of a, of a technical solution? Yeah. Um, as you said, consent is number one. So I think with all production music libraries that maybe even be, are watching this, um, almost every library owner I've talked to so far has come down on the right side of this to say, listen, I've either said no to these AI models coming in and training off our data, or if they do offer us some income to do that, I'm going to definitely go ask permission from my composers. Because the tricky thing about this is none of the current production musical library contracts that are with composers it probably included AI clauses. Maybe a few of them were that <laughs> forward thinking, but most of us had no idea this was something that we had to think about right now. So we've probably got a lot of outdated contracts that need to be outdated that don't even like include this topic. So that would be one is just making sure that if any AI technology is being involved in training off of your music or using your music to create new music, you're at least informed of that. You've got a choice for that. Um, some of the stock library companies out there, some of them went ahead and just let AI companies train off of all their composers music and basically said, yeah, you've, you can opt out, but it's already happened. You can take your music off now, but it's already been trained. And that felt kind of icky to a lot of composers to say like, oh, I wish you would have given me a couple of weeks notice or a couple of months notice so that, and then as time went on, newer stock libraries that started taking on those deals did take, take that approach. So the trend is going in the right direction in terms of these companies are realizing that you shouldn't just take the money and ask questions later. You should really be upfront and forthright about what you're doing with AI models. Now, one of the big considerations that I still think, you know, there's going to be many different approaches for how to do this. I was a bit disheartened, but I learned this. I talked to some data scientists. I said, well, what if there was like an AI model, like I said before, and there were some composers that threw their music in it. Couldn't there be a way for the AI model to do an, uh, a diagnosis or um, um, an audit on what it had created and said, well, John submitted that track and we used, you know, 2% of that track to create this new AI generated track and Jane gave us 5% of her drums and so that it doesn't work that way at all. So with a lot of these generative AI models, you cannot parse it out in terms of saying, well, 5% of your track was used here, 20% was used there. It is basically, you know, I don't know if we can get into all the technical details and I don't know how well I really understand it, but basically it's, it's not even taking the music like that. It's essentially using the music to create kind of abstract algorithms and abstract pattern recognition to then go ahead and generate its own music in the future. So it's kind of like asking me how much of that last rock track that I produced was, in, it was, um, uh, inspired by the Beatles and all the rock music I listened to and all those particular punk bands that I was into. How do you parse any of that kind of stuff out? Well, you might be able to pick out a little bit of a melody that's kind of close and maybe a drum beat that kind of sounds like this, but it's basically impossible to do that. So what you'd have to figure out is a fair model, an equitable model that feels like maybe one way you do it is if there's like, let's say a hundred composers that submit to a private label AI generative model. Maybe you just split up a blanket fee or if there are royalties associated with it, whatever the income stream comes from that AI model, maybe you need to just split that up evenly between the 100 people that equally submit to it. Or maybe there's some composers, they submitted a lot more content so that maybe they get a larger percentage share of the output. So whatever just feels right to people, that's that's one of those things where I don't know what the right solution is. There's gonna be multiple different approaches to that to figure out what works. But I think getting the right proper amount of credit, feeling like you're being paid properly, even if it's an AI model that you are not making the music, but you did supply it, right? You did help generate it. You did help train and sort of birth the AI model. So I think we got to figure out where that lands and everybody's going to have a different way that feels fair to them. Yeah. And with everything, um, there's always going to be people that are going to be game and there's going to be people that are going to resist, but it's going to happen. <laughs> so I think, um, I think just knowing that and accepting it and, and figuring out again, kind of where you land in all of this is going to be important. So is there any kind of uh, ideal for you? Like, is there any any licensing model that you've thought about and you really like and, you know, you'd like to see things move in that direction? I think the one that I've described is the best, uh, most exciting one I can think of so far, but I'm sure there'll be more. But I just think that the idea of we continue making our own human created music, of course. We keep supplying our library partners with that. But alongside of that, 
again, like the Grimes idea, she's going to keep making her own music. She's going to keep releasing her own stuff. But on the side now, she has this new revenue stream, which is partnering, you know, collaborating essentially with people that she's never met before, but taking 50% of whatever that energy and whatever that music does online. So I can see us kind of embracing technology the same way, where we keep doing what we're doing. We use the programs like Ames um, to help people find our human creations. But alongside of us, we, we create new revenue streams that just didn't exist to us before. So if we don't see AI as a, a replacement for us or as a threat to us, um, but we see it as a sort of an augmentation of what we're currently doing and also allowing us to create new revenue streams. And not only just in TV, film, sync licensing, that's I also have been encouraging a lot of my followers to think even broadly, more broadly than just the traditional markets that we've been looking at. We really need to start looking a lot more at uh, social media and P2P, like person to person licensing and how we actually get more music into more people's hands. Because if you see what's happened in all these technological um, uh, paradigms, it's basically just been democratizing the access to music um, more and more and more as time goes on. In the very beginning of the recording industry, it was a few small numbers of people that could get access to the recording equipment, get access to a recording studio. So there's a small number of recording artists that even have the chance of making it a full-time living to where you are today with a laptop, with some headphones, <laughs> and a couple of subscriptions to some music websites, to some sub cloud um, you know, library websites. You can have anything you want. You can make any kind of music you want. You can get your music out to anybody you want to. So we're just kind of opening up the door more and more and more to finding new revenue. So I, I, I'm always looking, at least I'm trying to always keep my eye on the idea that there could be new um, revenue models being generated because there are. We are we already seeing that with the metal, meta example with Grimes. Um, we're already seeing that there are new revenue models being generated. We just need to be the ones that are looking for ours, right? And not always being the ones just going like, no, 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 we want to resist it. We don't want anything to do in, come into our company or into our industry. We really want to be open and curious to this technology, which I, I really appreciate about you and the series of what you're doing here is to let us look for these and at least start start talking about them because if we're not talking about them we're not open to them we're not at least open to the possibilities i guarantee we will not see them when they do pop up so jesse i'd love to know where you think there's room um in an ai era for human creativity like where are those artists going to be found um what do you think is going to be vital about music and its ability to kind of be better than ai it's a great, great topic, great question, something I think a lot about. Um, I have no doubt that human creativity, human artist music, band music, singer songwriter music, original composer music, I have no doubt that will always remain relevant. I do think that music is a social um, uh, art form. Uh, we do, we, we make music for all different types of reasons. It's not just for enjoying music. There's all different types of social, psychological status uh, reasons that we make music. So I don't think that we are in any danger of an AI model replacing human music. I just don't think that's even something we're ever interested in. Novelty wise, sure. I'm going to want to listen to an AI. Can I, I do it from time to time on YouTube? You guys have seen some of those crazy, you know, Johnny Cash or Drake or whatever. You listen to it because you're like, oh, I'd love to hear what that sounds like. Johnny Cash singing Barbie Girl. I got to hear it but you hear it once and it's it's kind of done right it's not going to create a lifelong fan out of you you're not going to obviously dive deep into a rabbit hole of an ai artist or something like that so i don't think there's any risk of that however production music which is kind of like i call it sometimes transactional music meaning that it's really there as a supporting agent to the content that it's under right so if it's a reality tv show and there's a tense hip-hop cue well that hip-hop cue's primary job is not to emotionally react and reach and get a, a fan base going with the audience it's actually primarily there just to set the scene and to create an emotion and to allow the audience member to really get pulled into the emotion of the reality show right so in that situation i do think that these ai models could potentially be a big threat actually supplying that kind of music for some of these content creators faster, quicker, cheaper than human beings can. So what I've been coaching a lot of my members in Sync Academy and in my YouTube channel is you need to stop thinking of yourself as a background instrumental producer, because that's that's really what I did for most of my, pretty much all of my careers. Most of my placements are background instrumental, which is, it was great. But I do think that as we move forward in the next two, three, five years, that 
is something that's certainly on the potential chopping block. I'm not saying it's definitely going to be going away, or then definitely we're going to have AI models replacing us. But you can easily see that um, a reality TV show producer do they care that the hundred cues they throw into the background of their show was was created by a human being, or was it created by the 19.99 a month subscription service they they paid for to get access to all the AI music they need? Right. I don't think they really care. I think they're thinking about the bottom line. They want to save money. The audience also probably doesn't even care because they're not going to really notice or know. We don't usually get credits anyways on screen. Like, hey, that background cue you're listening to was made by Jesse. It's like nobody ever knows, right? We're just the kind of unsung heroes in the background of this industry. So we're, we're kind of at risk that way because there's just not a lot of human to human connection with production music. So we, I've been coaching everybody don't think of yourself as a background instrumental producer that can kind of hang out behind the scenes. You got to think of yourself as more of an artist now and definitely more of like a sync artist and spend much more time on pushing your creativity, adding more vocals to your music. That's definitely something that I've been pushing a lot of people to do. Human vocals with human lyrics, human emotions, human stories. That's the stuff that really pulls at the heartstrings. That's really the stuff that's going to get um, a content creator to want to maybe work with you, sync your music, get your music onto their platform or whatever their show is. So uh, a lot you can do right now but it's going to require that you see yourself much more of a, a spotlight artist, right? A little bit more in the spotlight, less of a behind the scenes person. So the garage band is back. Is what you're saying. <laughs> it, sort of in a way. Yeah. If, if, if you want to go just hundred percent for the garage band, all power to you. But if you want to do sync, I think th <laughs> there's still a bright future for you, but you definitely, like you said, you got to see yourself as a front and center artist and as somebody that, you know, hate it or love it, Social media has got to be part of your plan, too. You really do need to put yourself out there publicly. Whereas before, I would tell my students, don't worry about social media. Like, you can work with production music libraries. They don't care how many followers you have. They just care about the music. If your music is licensable, high quality, they'll take you on. You can get, that's, that was my, my career was 100%. I never placed, never talked about my placements, didn't do anything. It wasn't even on LinkedIn. Now, I think you do need to think a little bit more about creating human to human relationships. And that does mean a little bit of playing the game of social media. So some people are going to hate to hear that, but I do think that's a reality we got to face now. I actually think TikTok is the opposite of AI in the sense that what TikTok has taught us is that music really matters. Like they don't want sort of the production backgroundy music. They want, you know, sound on like music first. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, TikTok is pretty massive. It It's definitely going to uh, weigh in on the AI side of things and, and continue to consume and discover bands, real artists, et cetera. That's been its focus. So with all of these emotions swirling around with AI, obviously anxiety, fear, some excitement, hopefully some optimism as well. Um, you know, how can an artist or how can a composer sort of settle all of that? Because that's just a lot of very conflicting emotion. And so it can feel very disorienting, especially in this kind of, you know, new paradigm that we're entering. So how do you make sense of all this? How do you kind of feel more grounded? And how do you make some actual steps towards this? You know, the uh, I'd love to be able to give a, just a clear answer of like, it's just ABC, step one, two, three, just do this. But I don't think that that exists, actually. So I think right now, um, part of life is about embracing the chaos of it a little bit. So I think right now we're in a chaotic moment. I think everybody feels that because we don't know where the dust is going to settle. We're in the Wild West in a way. Right. So I have just been for me, um, I definitely want to. Um, be honest and real about how I feel. So I think when I first read and heard about AI, fear overcame me and my natural instinct was to just go deny that a little bit and just go, well, I'm just going to be optimistic about it. There's got to be some amazing opportunities. And I kind of denied the reality of what the actual threats of this technology could be for us. So as time goes on and I kind of calm down a little bit, I realize, you know, it's okay to feel some fear around this. It's okay to feel some um, uncertainty. It's okay to feel like I don't know what this means. I don't know where things are going to go. Um, I think we have to kind of get comfortable with this kind of gray area because a lot of life is uncertain, right? There's a lot of, especially the music industry. Um, we're kind of not, we're not new to this kind of thing. And I've definitely in my career, I know a lot of people watching this probably as well. We've all lost jobs where we thought that's it. My career is over. I don't have a future or we've lost relationships or we lost things where the unknown is just, the, it's almost intolerable because you just don't know where things are going to land. So I wish I could give an e easy answer. I will say that my guiding two principles that help me not lose my mind over all this and not completely give into fear or anxiety is uh, curiosity and openness. So I always look back to the labels, right? The labels are kind of my big 
billboard of what not to do, right? The major labels in the late 90s, early 2000s, when they saw Napster, they saw file sharing, what they did is they reacted in fear and in uh, resistance, right? Because they were just suing people, they were trying to shut things down, they wanted to get laws passed. They basically were not accepting it as a new way of life and a new technology. They're like, hey, maybe we could get in front of this, create a better solution, which is what eventually Apple did. But maybe we can get in front of this, create a better solution for customers, and we can kind of add this as a new source of revenue. And if it is going to completely replace physical media, we've got to just kind of accept that, embrace that that is just where technolo technology is going. How do we adjust? Do we need to slim down? Do we need to change our, our focus, change our distribution models, right? There's so many things that if the labels have been open and curious about file sharing technology, I think many more of them would be much more relevant today and probably be in much more business today because a lot of them just did not survive that kind of tsunami. So I'm always looking kind of to the past, the recent past to try to help me predict the near future, which is of course an impossible task. Nobody can predict the future. But if you kind of look through history, these technological revolutions usually settle off with some casualty of the old way of doing business. Some, I mean, there's still major labels, there's still big studios, right? There's still some remnants of the previous model. There's still radio stations, believe it or not, that exist. So there's still, still gonna be a small number of people that kind of keep surviving through the old paradigm. But then look at the massive amount of new opportunities that sort of explode as a result of it. So try to, I, for me, I look at the past, I look at what's happened recently, and I try to hold on to that optimism for the future. How would you propose that looking at historically what's happened with musicians and with the music industry and technologies coming about, and often they end up the ones calling the shots and the music industry doesn't necessarily control the narrative. What is the opportunity today to thrive together so that there's a win-win scenario where the creators, the IP owners, are actually working hand in hand on all ships rise together type of solution with the tech innovators. It's a great question. I think this conversation in this series is part of the solution for that, which is just show up, right? Show up. Let your voice be heard. Talk about it. Uh, talk with your production music library about these issues. This is one of the things I tell a lot of people who are working with libraries. Have you talked to them about AI? Have you talked to them about AI generative models training off of catalogs? If not, get that conversation started, okay? So you don't want to be a, a, a bystander on here. You don't want to be on the sidelines just looking and hoping. And then, you know, one thing I just cannot stand, and I get it quite a bit on my channel, I wouldn't say quite a bit, but a few times, is I'll get people that will be just full of despair. You know, well, it's never worked out in history for musicians. It's never worked out for producers. They always take advantage of us. Tech companies always, we're always the last line on the item. Nobody cares about us. Not going to be any different this time. Who cares? So yes, if you just don't give a crap about it, you don't want to even try, you don't even show up and try to talk about this stuff and put yourself into the conversation, absolutely these tech companies will run right over us. I don't think they care that much about the well-being of composers and producers. They might say, you know, they might say that they do. Of course, anybody can say that they do. But there are definitely quite a few of these companies that have been training off of copyrighted music without paying for it just to see if their AI models could do it, okay? So they're not releasing it publicly, so they're probably not at a, a huge risk of getting sued for something like that. But they're not showing already um, the most amount of restraint and respect for intellectual property. I've just, I'll just put it that way. So it's not, but I don't blame them for that. I, I put our us in that responsibility seat. We have to show up and say, hey, hey, you got to talk to us. You got to ask for permission. You got to compensate us. You have to realize that this is our way of life. This is our livelihood. And while we can be excited and work with you on this technology, you don't want us to become your enemy. You don't want us to be basically fighting against you as you build these tools. If we can work together, we could potentially create some amazing new opportunities for you and for us. So I think it really just comes down to showing up and making your voice heard and not just thinking, well, I'm so small. I'm so insignificant. And these big tech companies, they're so powerful. That's what a big a corporation would want you to think if they don't want you to be a kind of a little nuisance for them. They want you to feel powerless. They want you to feel like you don't really have a voice and that you're really not that important. So, and maybe individually, each one of us don't have a lot of power, but we do kind of collectively create and, and make up for a lot of the content that's on the internet. So I think we do have a lot of power, but we need to kind of think um, in terms of, of empowering ourselves and showing up for conversations, especially like this one. It is the music. Oh, go ahead, Jen. That's okay. Is the music business itself large enough to take on this fight and to uh, and, and to create an appropriate kind of collaboration? Should the music industry have a larger tent and bring under the tent other realms of creativity and artists? 
painters, sculptors, um, writers, um, you know, every creative environment where AI could um, uh, copy and replicate without credit given to the originator. So should, should, should this, are we having too narrow of a conversation? So there is a question out there in terms of whether it should just be, you know, the music industry as a whole, collectively composers, artists, labels, publishers coming to these tech companies and saying, Hey, we need to start negotiating this stuff. Or there should be a broader conversation where it's composers, artists, musicians, um, visual artists, painters, graphic designers, um, and movie creators and film directors, um, and all different types of creative endeavors, maybe all collectively coming together um, and bargaining with these um, uh, tech companies. I don't know the answer to that. The, the one concern I would have if you sort of got a really massive, broad IP coalition together is these tech companies kind of have individual models and individual departments that are dealing with all these different things. So I don't know in terms of the, you know, because each one is going to have its own individual needs, right? So music creators are going to have individual needs that are going to be different from a visual artist and different from a movie creator or a film director or something like that. So while there's definitely going to be some overlap in terms of consent, um, compensation and all that kind of stuff, uh, all the, the ways that these different art forms are being created with these AI models, I think are pretty unique. So I think maybe it could be a general good idea to just have IP creators in general kind of locking arms and saying, hey, we're looking out for each other, even though your interests are a little bit different than mine. We are all creatives and we're all trying to create income from our from our creative art, whatever that is. So there definitely could be a use there. But I do think that in terms of like the specifics of bargaining and creating actual deals, they probably have to be divvied up between the different types of um, art and the different types of models that are being used there. So I participated in the U.S. Copyright Roundtable sessions um, a number of years ago, and then I wrote a takeaway from that. And in the piece that I wrote, which was called TTC, um, Transparency, Trackability, and Collaboration, one of the things that I brought up is that typically technologies were born out of lawsuits. So I think there's an opportunity right now where we're learning from our past mistakes and saying, if we don't want a solution that is not aligned um, with our interests, then we need to actually be engaged in creating those solutions for ourselves. So do you feel that the music industry is in a good place at this point, having probably learned from the past that it really has to, you know, spin up its own legal, its own um, technical solutions, and really be at the heart of presenting those as opposed to um, sort of being given these solutions? It's a great question. And like, I, I want to be very hopeful about that to think that for sure, we, we have, as, as an industry, have learned our lessons from the past, right, of Napster and file sharing that we figured out, okay, that didn't work. Let's get better on it. You know, and when when we use the term like the music industry, what exact who does who is that, right? Because I usually think of major labels, major publishers, primarily as the music industry, because they're they're the the copyright owners, the IP owners for the most part. Um, but also, there's indie bands that are definitely part of the music industry, and there's uh, production music library writers like me and composers. Um, we're part of the industry as well, so. You know, so far what I've seen um, is not very hopeful. So at least I, what I've seen from the major labels is they've been trying to say no to AI music um, and trying to get it taken off of platforms and just fighting against it rather than figuring out, okay. Um, and maybe there are some sort of behind the scenes efforts of like, well, we don't want it to be um, introduced this way. We want we want to introduce it um, maybe in, in a way that's really beneficial for us and for our, our artists, that kind of a thing. So I'm not privy to any of that behind the scenes stuff. I hope that's what they're doing. I've heard some rumors of that might might be something that they're kind of thinking about or bringing on some new companies to do that. But, you know, the idea of the music industry itself developing the technology or coming up with these solutions, I'm not very hopeful on that only because this stuff is such a um, expensive endeavor, you know, to create an AI model that can do this stuff. It's not a cheap thing. Um, you also have to have a lot of expertise. So you got to have some data scientists. I don't know if a music, a record label or a publisher wants to go spend 
hundreds of millions of dollars investing in the technology and in the personnel to create their own versions of this. I just don't see that being likely. I just don't think that's probably what's going to be in their budget. Um, they're probably more likely going to be better suited by, um, you know, holding strong to say, this is our IP. These are, these are our rights. This is what we're looking for. And then try to create those meaningful relationships with the companies, the tech companies that can develop the resources for this kind of stuff. Because right now it's definitely centralized, but I think that will in the long run become more decentralized that everybody, you and I will have our own AI models on our computers. That's definitely going to be coming in the future. So when that's the case, you hope that whatever solution comes down the pipeline from the music industry um, thinks about that. And, and and they can be a part of that conversation to ensure that, you know, if I have a model on my computer that can just generate me music anytime I want to on the fly based on how I'm feeling because it's tied to some, you know, mood tracking <laughs> device that I have in my body, that that's getting some sort of royalties or some sort of payment or process out to the artist. So not very hopeful that the industry is going to create the solution. Um, right now, I'm not exactly hopeful that they're actually going to be part of the solution. I don't know. I hope that they will become, but I hope that this is could be, you know, this series and this conversation can maybe start nudging some kind of key decision makers a little bit more in that direction. I think on the tech front, you're probably right. I we've we've built enough technologies across time to know that each big platform has you know, its own way of doing things. But I absolutely agree that I think we can set the terms. I think as long as there is active dialogue across interests, across the industry, and that doesn't have to be limited to music. I mean, that can be, you know, IP owners. But I think if there's consensus around how we want it regulated, what those licensing models look like, how we want to be compensated in the future, that's the conversation that I think that we can really um, be part of the controlling the narrative and shaping the solutions. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the AudioSocket podcast. Stay tuned for more episodes and more guest speakers.